Howdy gamers, it's Leighton here from Leighton Night, the podcast that you're currently listening to in case you accidentally stumbled upon this, in which case I am sorry, but just wanted to let you know that there is a video version of this episode that is up on our Patreon for all tiers. So if you want to join us over there, depending on the tier, you can get all sorts of cool benefits. We do mini-sodes every week. We do some fun videos. Uh, You get access to our fan discord. And overall, it's a really lovely time and we would love to have you there. So without any further ado, here is the audio version of this episode. So if you want to do the video version, you can go to patreon.com slash Leighton Knight, or not. It's really whatever floats your boat. Anyway, episode... I'm so happy to see you guys. It's nice uh, to see you both. This has been, as as we said, years in the making. Yes. When was the last time y'all saw each other? January 1st, 2024. It wasn't so long ago. Yeah. Oh, it was, okay. Uh, just a month yeah. and a half ago uh, at an event that we frequently do nearby Los Angeles and yeah. Matthew it's and Robbie. Very mysterious. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't like to reveal too much about reveal my personal life. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm married to a wife and have daughter. Uh, <laughs> and that's all anybody knows. Mr. I don't reveal my personal secrets. You've been outed repeatedly as a piss drinker on this show. So oh, well, no. check, check yourself on that. Now that's something I didn't this know. This is news. Thank you, Leighton. Thank You're you. welcome. I'm going to take some notes and distribute this information to Brian's <laughs> Other curious. Okay, friends. now, now to be fair, <laughs> adding it to fans the of the show, fans of the show know that uh, my piss drinking quote unquote habit, as it were, <laughs> uh, was was an accident. Oh. I mean, the first time was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But then you develop a taste for it, and life, you know, nature, oh, nature takes its course. Ah. Layden, do you want to tell this story since I've told it so many times through through the eyes of a young person, Layden? How did this story come across? <laughs> oh, so we're going to get some ageism in there too? Sure. sure. Well, this is actually this is an interesting situation because I know for a fact that Matthew and Robbie and I are pretty much the exact same age by virtue of having graduated from college at the same time. And yes. it, so against which we should all be ages because we're all old. We're legit old yeah. now. We, we admire yeah. whatever youth you possess, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. I, You're so fresh-faced and beautiful. I, I have no idea yeah. where we place you on the spectrum of youngness. Clearly, generations below us. <laughs> so you're great. How old do you think Leighton is, if you had to guess? I'm not answering it. Robbie can answer it. I think it's 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 appropriate oh. for Robbie to I make mean, Leighton feel bad about herself. Mid to late 20s, to me, seems like very young. Is so, that, wow. did, yeah. you, did you get it right? Yes? I'm 26, yeah. There we All go. Right, there you go. People my own age have started to refuse to work with me, so oh. I'm 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 forced it's to, for other to dip reasons, a toe. Brian. Don't think that it's because of the <laughs> no, no, no. It's not because of the age. No, it's the piss drinking, which I'll <laughs> I'll TLDR <laughs> that. Why do you consent to work with Brian? Like, what is your <laughs> what is your excuse? He has some dirt on me that I'd prefer oh, not yeah, okay. get yeah. out. So it, this podcast runs on blackmail, like any good podcast does. It's my entertainment industry connections. Okay. Mm-hmm. Both of them. Most of Brian's relationships, <laughs> I think, are similarly strained. So I, I, I understand yeah. this. As ours will be in within two hours. Uh, <laughs> Layton, please. Anyway, Brian's in his studio garage, which is detached from his house. There is no bathroom in said garage. He drinks green tea. Uh, oh, he, no. Well, yeah. He, you know where it's going. Uh, he will... Piss in a receptacle. I feel like that's a legitimate mistake. It is. Because it looks the same color. Oh, yes. Brian, Brian, I will say. And that was just, that wasn't like a sprinkle as you were changing diapers or something. No. That was a swig. I thought this was going to be a story from childhood, not reasonhood. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It it happened about two years ago. I identify with the challenge of being far from a bathroom. Well, this is actually something I wanted to get into. Oh, oh, okay. on, on this on this show today. My favorite part of the story is that it's not like it was sitting in the garage and he drank it. He brought it back inside to put it in the fridge, correct? And so it was iced. And he spat it out. 
supposedly. To be fair, mostly. <laughs> Well, the thing is, as your reaction, I think, indicates you understand my predicament, which is that urine and green tea look remarkably similar. Yes, they do. Depending on how how, how, well hydrated you are. I've got to say, it depends. (laughs) There's a spectrum of possibilities. (laughs) There is a spectrum, you know, from from clear to opaque. Mm -hmm. And I I typically try to live right in the middle. um, The green tea spectrum. Of course. That's where (laughs) one Yeah, that's right. And look, here's the thing. Sometimes I'll bring the bottles of of tea out here, but not finish them, right? So it's only natural, to, because I love the earth, to bring them back in the in the house and put them in the fridge to be drunk another day. It doesn't. It's not carbonated. It doesn't go bad. It's a perfectly acceptable practice. The problem lies in when you have a half full bottle of a mystery substance that you have to generally accept that that's going to be tea, yeah. but. I my radar was off one day because I was in the middle of something and I brought the bottle back and then I went to take a nice refreshing swig the next morning. And- uh, what we're glossing over here yes, yes. is that the bottle was filled with the wrong substance to begin with. And that somehow slipped your you're, mind. You're, it must happen with enough frequency. Your studio is not that far away <laughs> from the bathroom, my friend. It's an utterly well. commonplace occurrence. <laughs> And therefore, the bottle might have been, I, I, I don't know, Brian. It happened once, to be fair. It happened That's once. It? And it, That's it? Yeah, 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 just okay. once. Drinking, wait, wait. No, no, no. The consumption or the or filling the of filling. the bottle happened once? Let's be That's clear. A, that's a very good question. Let me just say that it, it, it's not unlike murder. Like, you do it once, and then you're a piss drinker, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Now, have I peed in other bottles? I, I will confess to have done doing so. Um, having done so, that's what the construction I'm looking for. But only once did I actually drink hmm. said urine. So the rest, the rest of the time, I've been good about not doing that. And in fact, since this incident, I am now a lot more careful about not peeing in bottles. But sometimes I'm in the middle of a thing and... Now, Matthew, I know you understand my do, predicament here because you have a similar setup. I do. Um, I spent uh, an entire year living in a school bus with no bathroom and therefore had an urgent need sometimes in the middle of the night when the campground either had no bathroom or I didn't feel like going outside, which is an equally valid excuse. To I, Now, before we I went on our trip, I, I'm, not, I'm not done. I'm not done. Before we went on our trip, I purchased two medically appropriate containers. They are horizontal. They have a handle. There's a bright blue cap that's attached via a thingy to the to the bottle. So it's you can hold it. It it, it has the right contours for um for 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 careful aim. And uh, it was something that was necessary from time. I want what, to point out what, what are you that there to? were five other human beings in the bus with you yeah, at the I time. I went this. to the front of the bus away Suffering from the bed. in the same way no. that you did. You were we asleep. all managed to go outside and use the restroom. Only because most of you, you lacked either the will or the apparatus to <laughs> use the, uh, the receptacle that I purchased online in a two-pack. I got a backup one in case... You know. Now I, I'm gonna I'm gonna humbly interject here. Now we will talk about the bus in a moment, yeah. Yeah. but I also know for a fact that due to your home sleeping arrangements, this was a thing that you were doing long before you ever got anywhere what near that yes. bus. No. Anywhere you know near the bus. I wasn't gonna out him myself. Why do you but- purport to know that? And why would you tell? You that told me <laughs> when we haven't even like really gotten to know each other yet. I'm embarrassed. And I'm I'm worried that I'm being judged. You're, I, you're, okay. you're not, you're not look, being judged. Did, I'll ask you a simple question. What? Have you ever drunk it? No. Well, okay, no. then you're not being judged. <laughs> then this is a safe space. I, yeah. Well, as long as you don't share it with anyone else, okay? That's no. my only request is that it <laughs> okay. stays right here. A humble um, request to, to listeners of this show, don't, don't tell anyone to listen don't to it. Don't tell anyone. Else, even don't really take it in yourself. Um, Robbie makes me live in a building that has one bathroom that in order to get there from my regular bed, I have to go through up a short set of stairs, through a door, through another door, down a set of stairs, around an unfinished corner, across a rough hewn stretch of wood, through another door to get to the bathroom. That doesn't sound fun. But in my office, where I'm often forced to sleep in a sleeping loft because Robbie is officially nocturnal, works throughout the night, 
Then I have to go down a very steep and precarious ladder. I could injure myself if I'm waking in the middle of the night, not quite fully conscious. So I indeed do have a receptacle up in my sleeping loft that is sometimes available for emergency situations. I'm sorry Which that I had to, to admit on that. A regular I have basis. No idea what you're talking about. You have no evidence. You're never there. You're never <laughs> there. Now, now I, I know the context for this. To anyone who just heard your description of your home, they have no idea what kind of situation you could you could be in right now. So we're going to yeah, describe was, this in just a moment. I was going to yeah. ask if you're living in the house from House of Leaves, but it looks a little <laughs> too well lit in there. There's important context here, which we're going to get into. Uh, I'm going to introduce the show. This is the show introduction, which happens towards the beginning of the show usually. This is Late in Night with Brian Weck. My name is Brian Wecht. Over here, we have my esteemed co-host, Leighton Gray. Say hi, Leighton Gray. Hi, I'm Leighton, and I've never drank piss. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to be so smug about it, is all I'm going to say. I'm not smug. I'm factual. Mystery mm -hmm. guests, would you care to introduce yourselves? My name is Matthew Swanson. I write books for children. I drive a school bus. Um, I'm a commercial salmon fisherman. You, you make that like you're I have four a school children. bus driver. You have driven a school bus, no, no. but you're not a school bus driver. I drove. I drive a school bus. I'm going to drive a school bus. We're going to tomorrow. This out. I'm going to drive a school bus tomorrow. I drove a school bus yesterday. But you did not drive children to school on a school bus, which is what most people. I think. have driven my four children to 53 schools in a school bus. All I right. drive a school bus. Drive a school bus. I'm a commercial salmon fisherman. I married Robbie. I have four children. I write children's books. Um, I'm making mean lasagna. How about you? Yes. Oh, and I haven't drunk piss. If if that's how we're no, you know, sure. If I guess that's how we're introducing I don't know. ourselves. That's what we should all start with. Okay. I'm Robbie Bear. I have not drunk piss. I am an illustrator. I illustrate the books that Matthew writes. So we work together. Thank you, Robbie. Um, you're welcome. Mm. You also have four children. I also have four children. I also am a commercial salmon fisherman. Doesn't drive a school bus. I don't drive a school bus. Mm. You are correct. Mm -mm. No, he mm -hmm. won't let me drive no, the school bus. No, it's my I'm school the bus. navigator. You are. Now, I, I do want to provide some, some other context to the listeners here. How do we know each other? We went to school together. We went to college together. We did go to college together. But we together. didn't really know you, Brian, in college. I, I think mean, I, I knew Brian really. better than you did yeah. because That's I- That's definitely true. We yeah. had some very good friends in common. Brian was always a mysterious and mystical figure to me. Yes. I knew him as the composer of a song called Waltz of the Club-Footed Toddler that had a sort of mythical status among my fan group. That's true. I'm not telling a lie, right? No, that's true. Did I, did I say it correctly? It was something like that, yeah. Brian had great hair in college. It was a little intimidating. It, it inspired me. Brian continues um, to have great hair. There was, Brian, will you help me understand, was, was there an incident where I helped Chris and Rich turn all of your furniture upside down? Or did you turn all of Chris and Rich's furniture upside down? Okay. Let, wait, uh, we, we, we're going to get into that. Uh, okay. All right, but, all right. but I, I want you to finish the hair thought first, and oh. then we can talk about the furniture thing. <laughs> your, hair, your hair was magnificent. Your hair was- Was it not mullity? Was it mullity? That's your word, not mine. No. No, <laughs> it was not. Was it wasn't mullity. <clears throat> it was just long. It was just long. It okay. was not short in the front. The whole thing was the was whole long. Thing was a mane. Was it a party yeah. all over? Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, that's party front <laughs> that's and right. back. Yeah, all right. All party right. in the front and back. Yeah. Right. Brian, did there exist? I've seen pictures from that era of you with the ponytail, which is truly majestic. You could easily see it on the back of a stallion. But I, do you have any pictures of you without the ponytail, with just your locks flowing like you're on the cover of a bodice ripper? There is one that I might have somewhere where I was performing. I was actually singing uh, Killing in the Name of the Rage Against the Machine uh, at a at, at a local campus establishment. And you can see the hair all the way down. It's not a great picture, but I do have it somewhere. Uh, but the, the, just to answer your furniture question. So one thing, Leighton, about Matthew is he is constantly committing misdeeds and then blaming them on others, uh, which is precisely what has happened in this particular instance where he – so prior to us, uh, I believe, moving into a, a, a room, uh, you know, coming in for the new college semester, fresh-faced, bright-eyed, excited, uh, excited for what the year had in store – Matthew and his uh, posse of marauders came into our room and turned everything they could find upside down. And I mean everything, including coat hangers, furniture, everything that was there. And we walked into this new dorm room 
excited for what it might hold, and only to find that our dreams had been dashed and our year was ruined. Has that yet washed over you or through you? We even made the bed and turned the, we put the pillow under the bed and the, the, the sheets and the, I wasn't part of this, <laughs> please. I, I just heard about it. Uh, you weren't? Later, I, I thought I, you were part of that. No, I, I was there. I, <laughs> I was, yeah. Uh-huh. But, but just, just observing so that someone could tell the tale later. I would never do that to you, Brian. But you also asked if it was a thing I did to you. And I think that's notable <laughs> that the, the vector there just got flipped. Who punched who, I guess, is the question. I, I don't remember. L- l- like everything bad that's ever happened to me, I have no idea why, but I'm sure it wasn't my fault. Uh, I agree. Yes. Confession to make. I texted several of your friends before this mm-hmm. podcast and asked them to dish dirt that I could unearth <laughs> on, the, on the pod today. And uh-huh. they were surprisingly reluctant to do so. One of, them commented, one of them commented that it was unnecessary to provide embarrassing uh, information because you would so likely embarrass yourself, and uh, <laughs> perhaps you can uh, perhaps you can guess who that was. But I'm just uh-huh. saying your friends are stoic and refuse to betray you for the sake of of my podcast fodder. So I, I wow. think that's notable. I do. It looks like those payments have been working. Are you stoic and unwilling to betray him? Is I'm the real question. You I have, have any a terrible memory. Good, that's, any good great turn thing. on Brian? Yeah. Brian is an upstanding citizen, as far as I remember. He was the victim of of so many uh, plots. Um, what can I, Robbie? Help me out here. I'd, I'd like to embarrass Brian. I mean, I, I wish I had known Brian well enough to in college to have anything embarrassing on him. Don't let me down, guys. I, yeah, I feel I, we're going to work on it. Brian, would you please embarrass yourself on my behalf? <laughs> Could you do me a solid? And share as some old friends. enticing tidbit. Yeah. That, as sure. If I had said it, as if I had turned your furniture upside down. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a couple things that I have been uh, maligned for doing that okay. I, I stand by as being funny. Okay. Um, but may, may indeed be embarrassing. Several of these happen to uh, mutual acquaintances of ours. Now, it is true, I will say, Robbie, you, we, I'm not sure we ever even like talked. I don't think like, we ever talked. I don't no, think we intersected at all. As a musician, yes. As a serious musician, yes. Um, who he, you did like the pit orchestra for various things? Did, did you, you? Did you conduct? I did. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I saw you frequently and thought that is a talented musician. But well, well. I didn't know you. Sorry. Also, yeah. Brian once gave a mathematics colloquium one afternoon because he oh, was okay. also a talented mathematician. Yes. And someone said, hey, you want to go see Brian? And I was like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, oh. I did love you. So the, the, there, there are two stories I can tell. One is short, one is slightly longer. And I can't remember if I've told the longer one on this show before. Um, one is uh, our mutual friend, Rich, who is... Yeah. Uh, uh, a, a lovely human being, maybe the worst guy I know. <laughs> I will defend Rich all day long. He's my favorite person. I'm sorry. He's the best. Rich, Rich is truly the best. If I am suddenly murdered or slain, Robbie, I'm Rich, moving in with Rich. Rich is her backup husband. Yeah. Did mm-hmm. you know that? Yeah. So he, that's, I did that's, know that. He's quality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So please yeah. don't murder or slay me. <laughs> I love this context of before the show, the beginning of the show, that you guys describe this as the show as Brian talking to Rich. Yeah. Pieces yeah. are falling into place. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Well, I, I, so I, uh, I like to have fun. I like to hang out and have fun. Those are my two main priorities. I like to chill out, hang out, have fun, be cool. Drink cool piss. Things. Uh, drink piss. Yeah. So one day, I don't know, a year and a half into my relationship with Rich, a relationship that has gone on for 30 plus years at this point, which is a crazy thing to say, but it is true. Uh, I walked into his dorm (laughs) dorm room. (laughs) This is going to make me sound like a complete monster, which is why I'm laughing. I was standing next to his (laughs) shelf full of food had to sneeze and turned and uncovered sneezed all over it because oh. I thought it would be funny. Was the food packaged? Was it like it, granola? It bar? was, it was, it was. What was Rich's reaction? Did he say, ha ha? He, no, he, he was not happy. <laughs> no. And I thought it was very funny. And he got a little bit upset for no reason. 
Am I the asshole? <laughs> Look, it, it, I, what can I say? I was, I was young at the time. There were extenuating circumstances, which is that I thought it was really going to be funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I admire Rich for being so offended. I have to yeah. say, if somebody sneezed on my clothes bag of Doritos, I don't think I'd care. Right. You can wipe, wipe it, it off. off. Right. See? Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't fruit or soft cheeses. Maybe he's not my backup husband. We'll see. I'm going mean, to sneeze all now, over his stuff all the time. So, so there's one, one story that paints me possibly in a poor light. This next story, Matthew and Robbie, I think you guys have heard at some point. Layton, have I ever told you about the, the time I taught uh, the birthday problem in a math class? Yeah, you have very yes. early in okay. the show. So, yes. So I don't want to belabor the show again with a long story. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I know what the birthday problem is. Like the, the people in the room having the same birthday, the, the likelihood of that? Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. Okay. So it turns out if you have, I think it's 26 or more people, there's greater than 50% chance that two people have the same birthday, month and day, not year. And long story short, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. I taught a class. I was TAing. Uh, we were probably juniors or something at the time. Taught a class, and I wanted to illustrate that I believed this result. And I said, if no two people have the same birthday in this large class, I'm going to drink this entire bottle of clam juice. Uh, oh, well, I, I uh, thought it was going to be piss. Do you not know this? <laughs> no, no. But, no. All right, good. <laughs> I would never drink piss, <laughs> Robbie, and I'm kind of offended that you you think I might. You brought the clam juice with you for emphasis, or it was a hi- hypothetical clam. So what I did as as a as a, a master showman indeed, the greatest showman, I left this bottle of clam juice on the table in the front of the classroom for the duration. And, you know, people were curious. Their curiosity was piqued. What is this bottle of clam juice doing here? This bottle of clam juice isn't normally in a mathematics classroom. Why would it be there? Well, this is why. Halfway through the class, I reveal. Now, cutting to the chase, no two people had the same birthday. And then in front of... God and Williams College, I chugged a bottle of clam juice, which caused at least one person to <laughs> run from the room. <laughs> <laughs> Brian does have that effect on people. <laughs> now, the asterisk to this story is that lemonade and clam juice look exactly the same. Wow, well and done. I had replaced the bottle of clam juice with a, you know, some lemonade. I did not do the thing where I passed it around and asked people to check that the top hadn't been popped and that sort of thing. So I really had emptied the bottle of clam juice ahead of time and just chugged a small container of lemonade. Let me tell you, when Matthew and I started dating, Matthew's entire diet was cans of clams. True. And (laughs) and And mac and cheese. Together? Yeah, you put them together. It's delicious. And the juice so, is delightful. I would drink, I would open the can, I would drink the juice, I would empty the clams into the Mac. So, uh, Brian, I think you missed an opportunity. I think you wasted some clam juice. Apparently I did. That is awful. That is worse yeah. than a story. Why yeah. do they sell it's it if it's not supposed to be? <laughs> it's a delicious. It's well, a de- because you're supposed to use it in other things, linguine and white clam sauce, maybe uh, I skipped that step and just drank it. (laughs) I didn't have time to fuss. I was a bachelor. I didn't have time for cooking stuff. I think it's the addition of the cheese that's the most upsetting part to this. Cheese and clam, yeah. Yeah. That's my pub. Has anyone had it? Has anyone had it? No. No, of course not. No. You're just sensible people. You're just imagining. (laughs) No, but but I think about like the abomination that is lobster mac and cheese, (gasps) which I can't believe we're pretending is good. But I I see that we have some opposition here. Is this the segment where you admit your shortcomings? What what part of the show is this? (laughs) I have many shortcomings, and that's certainly in the top three hundred. So Brian told his his tales of woe. Can you share something? We don't know you well. Yes. What can you tell us about yourself that Uh. would help us understand you and and your human frailty? You don't drink clam juice and you don't drink piss. So that's it. So what do you have, Layton? What's left? What do you drink, Layton? What do I drink? A lot of. I'm in my Uncrustables era right now. This is a younger is generation, that? Matthew. Matthew says it's so old he doesn't is even know what that is. Is that a sandwich without yes, crust? I think so. It is. It's a frozen peanut butter and jelly, like, essentially a ravioli, basically. Do you eat it just frozen or it comes frozen? No, you, you, you defrost it and then it's, like, soft. Oh, okay. That would be the equivalent is eating frozen Uncrustables. Oh, it, and I will tell you, I've done that 
out of desperation because I didn't want to wait. It gets bizarrely crunchy. I don't really care for it, but I'll eat it. Is it just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah. They're also so stupidly sweet, like soft white bread, but the the crimped edge is the very best part. Oh, it's crimped. <sighs> yeah. It's worth a shot. If you have four all children, right, right. We do. strawberry is better than grape. They also do it with like Nutella instead of PBJ. <sighs> I've oh, never had those. I have to admit something to you both. Robbie mm. has uh, gotten us wrapped up with this man named Eric who tells us make it sound so bad. what to eat and what not to eat. And okay. Eric has told us that we can't eat Uncrustables because they contain two things. So we're not, many things. We're not allowed to eat sugar. We're not allowed to eat grains. Grains? You can't have grains? Not right now, Brian. The final straw. Not even the final straw. There's so much more of this. Eric took away my coffee, and I'm on day five of no coffee, and my brain is, is not useless. right. It's a useless mush. So you're not getting the best of me, or maybe you're getting the best of me. What possessed you to have this person tell you what to do? Well, yeah, I hope there's a good reason. Tired of not feeling good about yeah. ourselves all the time. We wanted to see what it was I'm like. I'm trying to be a sensible human being as I become old. Yeah, I want to be less tired. So I just wanted you to know I can't have any Uncrustables. Sorry for your loss. Here's my question to you. Yes. Um, do you think the way you feel about your current health could have in any way be related to living on a school bus for more than a year? That did do a little bit of damage. <clears throat> I recently went through, I took notes every day. Okay. I think we need context yeah. here. So context, before we go into please. this. All right, all right. All right. Yes. So Robbie and I and our four children and one dog at the start set forth from our home on August 30th, 2022 in a 23-foot school bus that had been converted into a tiny home, except there wasn't any room for a bathroom. So that's what I was getting at earlier. And our goal was to bring uh, books to book deserts across the country. So specifically, we drove our school bus to a Title I elementary school in each of the 50 states plus D.C. So just so you know, Title I is a federal designation for schools that serve a high population of kids who um, qualify for free or reduced lunch, which generally is a measure of high poverty pop populations, but it doesn't, it, it, usually the numbers are higher than what qualify because kids have to fill out paperwork. So there we go. Sorry. So, so regarding one. books, the statistic yeah. that is important to wrap your head around if you grew up in a household with lots of books is that in America's low income communities, the ratio of children to books is 300 to one. So there are many, many places in this country where there just aren't books. There's not a culture of reading and literacy. There have been really compelling studies that have shown that if you aren't a fluent and facile reader by grade three, you have a completely different trajectory in life in terms of your prospects for achievement and avoiding poverty. So without um, belaboring the point, there are 47,000 Title I public schools in the United States. All of those schools, you know, almost half the kids need to be fed by the school because they're not getting adequate food at home. So anyway, we are authors. I'm an author. Robbie's an illustrator. We create children's books. We go to these affluent elementary schools as invited guests, and we get paid to give presentations on creativity and collaboration. and Which are great. Awesome. Seeing you give these talks, they're amazing. Oh, thank you. Yep. So like the kids get a lot out of it. The teachers get a lot out of it. There's a lot of excitement in the community. However, the 47,000 schools don't have the budget or the mandate to bring in authors because yeah. they're trying to, to... They have other things to spend that money on that are more urgent needs, right? So so we said, well, why don't we provide the school visits for free? Why don't we give books to all of the kids in the schools that we go visit? Every kid, every teacher gets a book. So that's what we did. So we put together this tour last year, last school year. and we Called, did, called the Busload of Books Tour. And yeah. Robbie painted the bus with a very colorful mural of uh, book-themed happenings and landmarks and we set out and we had we had the adventure of our awesome. lifetime. We, we uh, drove like 33,000 miles. 34. She 34. always shortchanges me a thousand miles. 34,000 miles. We drove the bus to all of the states except Hawaii. Yeah. We left the bus in Atlanta, flew to Hawaii. But we did drive across British Columbia and the Yukon to get to Alaska, which was the most wow. stunning part of the beautiful. drive. The context I want to add when we're in the earnest section of the show here <laughs> is that we thought we were on a mission to give away books right? And to bring assemblies to these communities. And we did that and the kids loved it. But the thing that we realized we were actually doing as we traveled around 
was making communities and kids and teachers feel seen by virtue of having been chosen and selected. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd meet teachers say, I I never win anything. I never get anything. Nobody ever comes here. A lot of the schools we visited were in rural communities that were in the middle of nowhere that we could go to because we were living in a bus and driving wherever we went. But no author is going to go six, you know, hours out of their way to go to a tiny, tiny school in Idaho, for example, right? So so we did all that. Like, no, this was leading to a question. We were explaining ourselves. We were well, providing- I was asking about your, your, your health and how living on the bus affected it. But I do think this is a good, a good chance to talk more about the, the bus because we are in it. Our health was poor because <laughs> we were fed pizza by all the schools. We avoided fast food we well at the beginning. We did avoid fast food pretty well. I, it just was poor. There was lots of snacking. Well, there, there was also every... Every area has their own like specialty food, which yeah. I was excited to try. And they're all deep fried yes. and um, deliciously <laughs> medium fatty. So, Especially yeah. in the great uh, Southeast. Ah, that's United not States. true. Everywhere. The Everywhere. upper Midwest. Yeah. Yes. We had oh, lots the of Southwest. Yeah. Uh, New England. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the places. We all had the places. lots of delicious, but not super healthy foods on this trip. And this is for, for context here too. You guys raised a bunch of money. We did. To do this, like this was a not only a labor of love, but also a fundraising exercise to get the you guys around and books in kids' hands. It was ten years of kind of dreaming to make this happen. Three years of sort of fundraising and planning, and one year of intensive sort of scheduling and one right. giant yeah. spreadsheet, yeah. super big. Yeah. Spreadsheet. <laughs> it was a, and yeah. Yeah, you, you. I mean, not only was it, as you said, the two of you, but also your your kids, including a teenage daughter who got pulled out in the middle of a important social time in one's life, and it was like a, it was a big thing for all all of you. But I imagine, especially for Alden, who you know probably had a great time for some of it and less of a great time for <laughs> other she parts. Was of a, it. She was a freaking champ. That, like, <laughs> honestly, this trip could have been just pure misery every minute of every day if our kids had not decided to be fully on board. And they just rolled with it, and including Alden, but also our youngest who was in kindergarten at the time. He literally, every time we did a school visit, he would walk into that kindergarten class and just like, here's what I'm doing today. And he'd spend all day in the <laughs> kindergarten class and meet all the friends. And We're trying to figure so if there has ever been yeah. a situation in which a child has attended kindergarten in all 50 states. In, in the past. Was there ever another context in which that happened? Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah, probably not. It yeah. would be a very weird context. <laughs> like like, like your, your journeyman kindergartner. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I, I do want to talk too briefly because this is something that uh, is now in, in, a, in a former phase of your life. But you guys for a while, you know, when you first, I don't know, tell me if this is wrong. When you first started out as a author illustrator duo you were doing your subscription service mm-hmm. yes books right so you guys had a very cool thing for a while that you no longer do right but i think listeners of this show will appreciate and think is cool so this started back in 2006 Six. Yeah. we were doing what we call we called uh, commercially non-viable picture books for adults so we were making picture <laughs> books and they were kind of zany, but we like always got a little bit ambitious on the production end and we would like make, you know, square spine books. So we would make these books that Matthew wrote in. He wrote these really weird little like what would you call satirical social commentary, commentary. Very funny for the most part, says Matthew. Very funny. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I agree. I thought they were great. No, I thought they were funny, too. Um, and then I would illustrate them. And like we thought we would revolutionize the way that adults read books, but. That didn't happen, but... But we had a lot of fun. Uh, Can I back up for just a second? The context for this was Robbie went to graduate school, got her MFA in illustration, and then I was going to go get my MFA in creative writing, and we would go together and be professors at a college somewhere, right? That was Mm. the plan. That was the plan. Except Matthew failed to persuade any of the MFA programs that he was sufficiently (laughs) talented on the writing front to admit them into their program. I applied to six... MFA programs, the finest programs in the land, and I received seven letters of rejection because the <laughs> University of Minnesota rejected me on consecutive Mondays. They sent me the same letter with the date changed. 
So Fantastic. I don't know if it was. In case it wasn't clear last week, we still don't want you here this week. <laughs> so, so this was a, a yeah. wild plan B to, to start our subscription service. Yeah. We quit our jobs. We had these very nice jobs at a design firm. I was an account executive. Robbie was a designer. We quit our jobs. We sold our house. We moved into this building that we're in today, which is an old barn. Robbie's uh, mom's pottery studio is downstairs. This face was all in spinach. <laughs> this face was uh, all spinach. <laughs> this face was all unspinached. This, okay. <laughs> Title of the episode I'm, right there. I am a spoonerizer when I'm tired. Yes. So this space was all I unfinished. Ah. Uh, this face was all unspinached. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> So, so anyway, we were going to move here for one year, burn through our savings and make our silly little books. And here we are, uh, 17 years later, 18 yeah. years later, still making, silly still, little books. still making books. So yeah. yes, we did the self-publishing for about 10 years. We self-published about 70 books together during that time. Wow. Um, cause we just were having fun. And we sold them on subscription, which at the time, like now you can get everything on subscription yeah. at the time. You couldn't get things on subscription, so it was kind of a novel idea, so we had that going for us. Yep. And it was fun. It fun was to receive fun. a new book in the mail every month. And it was like a club, right? We sent a letter yes. along with it. We, we we tried to make it fun. We tried to create a community out of it. And to a certain extent, we did. We did. It was, a lot of those people was, still follow but us. But we and never made a lick of money. We didn't make any I mean, money. it's very, like, the money that we got from the subscriptions paid for the paper and ink, but we yeah. never paid for our time. So I had a job throughout this time. I kept working for the design firm halftime from home, which paid the bills and gave us the creative freedom. So when we talk to people who are interested in creative careers, the best advice that we can give is find something that you like to do enough to support yourself so that your art doesn't have to support you. And that doesn't have to be subject to the limitations of making money while you figure out if you can, how to use it to make money, which we have finally kind of done. When I talk to people about this sort of thing, the example I always use, I've talked about this guy on the show, is Charles Ives, the uh, New England composer, you know, yeah. for late 19th, early 20th century. This guy was a compositional genius and also a lifelong insurance salesman, which he used to make a ton of money so he could write really out there fucking music, like crazy shit that was light years ahead of its time. And because he didn't have to rely on, you know, on it for money, he could do literally whatever he wanted. And long story short, the guy very, very late in his life, right before he dies, end up, ends up winning the Pulitzer in, in music for his, I think his fourth symphony. But it's, you know, we, we, we hear a lot when we do Q and A's for NSP stuff, like how can, how can I do what you do, right? How do I get to be there? And the thing that we emphasize over and over is just because you're not doing it full time doesn't make you less legitimate than someone who is. My other piece of advice, since we're giving advice, is to keep showing up. Like, it's very easy to get discouraged and to just be like, screw it. Like, I put in two years. We put in 10 years before we even had like a blip of interest from anyone else. So showing up and showing up and showing up, eventually somebody's going to be like, oh, I guess they're doing something interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Or they wouldn't still be doing it. And you never yeah. know at what moment the yeah. thing will happen that lets you take the step from the place you are to a new place. Yeah. So you have to just always be present. Yeah. And the the sort of analogous piece of advice that's going to be very hard for you to follow, Brian, if you want to be successful. Don't drink your piss. Don't <laughs> be, don't be an asshole. All right. Mm. Like, <laughs> I have to go. It's absolutely true. When we talk to kids like <laughs> be positive. Uh, give thanks to people who help you out, show up with a smile on your face. Like it's so many times we've been given the benefit of the doubt because of the fact that we're nice about it. So I don't know, Brian, I, I think there's hope for you. You show glimmers sometimes. <laughs> thank <of> being you. <laughs> friendly. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Layton. That's a really strange uh, yes. smile, but it's I, still a smile. <laughs> I believe you're a good influence on Brian. That's my, she, she really is. I try. Yeah. <laughs> that is really, really true because there are lots of talented people out there. And if you have to pick a talented person to work with, you're going to pick the person who's easier to work with yeah. rather than the, yeah. the asshole. I'm experiencing this right now. If you're nice to work with clients in the future, will be like, Hey, other people should work with you or yeah. we want to work with you again because you're really nice and easy to work with. And unfortunately, especially in creative industries, especially in game development, 
there are a lot of people who just pretend that doesn't exist. And yeah. they think that because they're an ideas guy that they can treat people like shit. Um, newsflash, everybody. Everyone is an ideas guy. <laughs> Everyone wants yeah. to be the ideas guy. That doesn't mean shit. You need to be able to do the idea or nobody cares. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I, I used to, you know, there's this famous Edison quote, right? Genius, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. When I was growing up and I heard that quote, I always thought it was about hard work. But as I age, I think it's less about hard work and just meaning that most of what you try is going to fail mm. mm -hmm. creatively. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. And because failure is such a, a consistent part of any creative endeavor or any endeavor, frankly, one of the things that's helped us out a lot is having each other uh, on hand for the kind of support that you need at the low points. So there's a, a phenomenon that Robbie and I have observed. If one of us is having a bad day, the other one will have a great day. We will sort of counterbalance each other. It's called like, <laughs> like a seesaw. No, it's so that it, the, the person who's not having the bad day has a bulwark, someone to help them out. Like we just help each other. We pick each other up kind of unconsciously Yeah. when when stuff falls apart, which it does. Like it, it just does. Yeah. So um, not everybody works with their spouse, but having a creative partner, having somebody in your creative space who can be that source of support, encouragement, feedback, someone you can trust and someone you can also turn to. Also somebody who's just like, yes, we worked really hard on that. I know what we did in order to get that done. And it's too bad that nobody else appreciates it. But God damn it, I appreciate it. Yeah. Creativity can yeah. be so lonely. It can be lonely. Yeah. 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 And I think being able to have a creative partner on anything is additionally really helpful if you struggle with like self-loathing or self-criticism or just like hating everything that you make because then it's like, well, they worked on it too. So I can't, I'm not allowed to hate this <laughs> because my friend helped me yes. make it and they do yeah, really totally. good stuff. So we're making each other better and neither of us can say that we hate this. That's, that's, that's such <laughs> yeah. a good point. Yeah. I want to say also, you know, just to to put a cap on the on this on this trajectory of yours, that now you are, you, you have a few different series of successful children's books, which are also also you know my family loves them, and you're on w w which which Ben Yokoyama book are you currently writing? Is it seven? I just, just turned in book seven to my editor, and I'm waiting to hear back from her. I and, just finished the illustrations for book six, so yes. that'll come out in the spring. Seven. That's, books, that's yeah. an insane number of books in a series. Yeah. Yeah. It I, and it sort of sneaked up on us. You know, we sold it as a three book series. It was extended to five and now it's been extended to seven. And yeah, that's suddenly when I look, it's a big fat stack of books. It's cool. It's, yeah. it's really getting to build a world and explore it. And it's been really fun. Yeah. It, it's really cool to, you know, go out. We spend quite a bit of our time in children's bookstores and to see yeah. your stuff on the shelves. We have, you know, a couple of friends that are our children's authors, our mutual friend, uh, Tui, Tui Sutherland, yes. who wrote the We're Wings right of Fire We're right next to her on the book. bookshelf, which is awesome. I yeah. know. And seeing you guys and Tui together. <laughs> and and Raina is also near us. Raina Telgemeier mm -hmm. is often shelved near us too, because she's the T. So we've got, yes. we've got good company in our good, section yeah, of the shelves. Yeah. Section. Yeah, totally. Uh, but it's so exciting to see, you know, as we go into those stores over the years, to see your section getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> of course, Tui's section has been huge for, yes, you know, yes. forever. So it's it's just exciting to see so many friends succeeding with such a visible metric, you know. And the books are so colorful looking, right? You just leave a little rainbow of books. <laughs> I, I love shelf. making it's books so for cool. Kids. Yeah, It's not yeah. what we ever thought we were going to do starting no, out. No, it sure isn't. But boy, do I love it. Yeah. Um, so when I talk to my daughter and other people her age who are so concerned about what they're going to do when they grow up and wanting to figure out right now, so they can, my daughter was saying last night, I want to get a head start. I was like, ah, you can't. I, no head start. I figured out my career yeah. when I was 35. Yeah. And in oh, between, between now and 35, then, I, was, I wish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're still working on it's, it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I, of course, I went through a big career change at 40. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. which is now almost 10 years ago. Uh, but I up. certainly was, it is fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how to figure anything out. You just kind of do whatever's interesting and hope for the best. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. You guys, you know, you're the best where my family and I are 
huge fans of, right. of what you guys do because it's it's great. It's it's great. It's fun, and it's the total package. The illustrations are great. The writing's great. It's just all fantastic. Thank you, thank you. The most important metric is that Audrey loves it and yeah. thinks yeah. the books are very funny and is just like obsessed with them. What's Audrey's favorite one? She likes, let's see, I forget the precise title. What's the the second Ben Yokoyama book? Was it the second or the third? What are the first three? The Cookie of Doom, The Cookie of Endless Waiting, The Cookie of Perfection. It's it, it's the Endless Waiting one. Yeah, that's okay. the one she likes the most. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and she also loves the the Real McCoy's yeah, As do I we. love the Real yeah. McCoy's too. That yeah. second Real McCoy's book is is her favorite also. Nice. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Aww. And does Audrey care at all that you know the author illustrator? Oh, yeah, is that a thing? Uh, not really. A little a little bit. Audrey's hard to impress. I was going to say, she I always standard. plays it cool when yeah. I've seen her. Yeah. Yeah. Because she'll ignore the fact that I'm a game developer until she can get social capital from being like, this is my friend Leighton. She's a game developer Uh, (laughs) when I went to her school one day. So that's going to give her more cred with her peers than author illustrator. Right. That's true. That's true. true. Uh, Yeah. Alas. I don't make Roblox games, but I I make games that are uninteresting to her at her age. (laughs) What just occurred to me, and maybe this was intentional is that, so is Roblox, is that a, play on roadblocks is that intentional uh, i i don't think so because it, it occurred to yeah. me yes. because audrey is on an endless campaign to get roblox and i keep not. putting up roadblocks to prevent oh. her from doing so Uh-oh. because she's not fucking getting roblox because a she has enough games and B, it seems much easier to interact with strangers on the internet through Roblox than through other things. So, and that's my job. (laughs) Oh my God, wait. I had this great interaction with your child, Brian, when I was babysitting her on that note of, I guess, talking to people online. But she was showing me that game Animal Jam that she plays. Oh yes, she has a little friend that plays it. Yeah, so she was showing me that, and I was like, oh, it's like Webkins or Club Penguin. And she was like, what are those? And I was like, oh, they were, they're just like this. I, I played them when I was your age. It was like this, but... And then she interrupted me and went, worse? <laughs> <laughs> she is so brutal. Yeah, yeah it, was, uh, it was offensive. Can you also me. tell the story, what did she say to you when you were putting her to bed? <laughs> And you asked her what she was doing. I, this is one of my favorite Audrey stories. Of, this is the rudest she's weeks. ever been to me to my face. <laughs> uh, we had a lovely day where I babysat her for like seven hours or something. We're coming up on bedtime. As a babysitter, I am a little too generous with allowances and that's fine. You know, that's what I'm here for. And so, you know, I'd given her an additional 10 minutes gaming before hustling off to bed. And then it was just... Her doing the child thing of actually there are like these 10 different activities that I need to start right now and it's me winding down for bed actually. Yeah. But she had her little headphones in and was listening to a podcast or whatever as she was, you know, subsequently playing with slime and then eating <laughs> a tiny bowl of chips and then <laughs> pouring a water and then like opening a new box of I don't even know what it was. And every time I was like, whoa, 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 Audrey, what are we doing? We're, we should have wrapped up like 10 minutes ago. What's going on? And as like on the fourth task or whatever, she has her headphone out for a second. And then she just goes, don't worry about it. <laughs> Puts the <laughs> headphone back in and goes back to it. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. She had oh fully God. turned around and had the headphones on. So she did not catch my reaction of, oh, Audrey, (laughs) just she can be a little uh, a little brash with me sometimes, but that's definitely the most dismissive I've ever heard that child be, (laughs) including to her father. (laughs) You guys know how it is around this age. She is nine, almost 10. You can see teenagerhood percolating in terms of the attitude and definitely she's getting there. I remember my sister saying, I think when her kid was 12 or 13, at one point saying, remember, I am a person, <laughs> which is, you know, it's very easy. And we we did it when we were kids to just take your parents for granted and not, you know, understand that they too are human beings with thoughts and feelings of their very oh, own. I thought the don't. child said, remember, I'm a human. No, no. My sister said that to her <laughs> oh, wow. kid. Mm-hmm. 
because you know it's it, it's just a natural thing to you know be I'm always like I can't believe the stuff we put up with with, with as kids like can you believe that like going to the principal's office was going to be something like that you changed your behavior over? Like, yeah, <laughs> like what? Who, what? What's that oh, guy going to do? Also, by the way, fucking like grades in like yeah. sixth grade or something. Yeah. Who, cares Who cares what grades you get Who in cares? sixth grade? Yeah. I was definitely worried about whatever, getting A's, you know, getting good grades. But I am hard pressed as an adult to think of something that matters less than what letter grade you receive in, you know, anything below high school. Yeah, even middle school. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. Who cares? Totally irrelevant. Like, fail and all the tests you want. Yeah. Because I was such a very nervous, like, very type A, straight A kid. And uh, I definitely had a real chip on my shoulder about kids who weren't because I was a little asshole, as all children are. And... As an adult, like in professional context, it's just like countless very successful people being like, I don't know, I got these all the time. Like it's it does not. Oh my god, totally. One to one translate into your success as a human at, at fucking all. And I wish that I had understood that and maybe gone a little bit easier on myself as a child. Oh, same. On the one hand, we say that, but on the other hand, it sounds like all four of us were like overachievers who. Who got worked lots really of A's. hard yeah. and got lots of A's. And that's maybe yes. also why we're here. Yeah. I will say, so I, I don't think the letter grade itself matters. I do think yes. hard work matters. And 100%. that those are two different things. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that certainly my parents, my, my parents didn't have to worry about me too much in this regard because I was always school motivated. But uh, one thing that I have heard, and you, I'm sure you guys have as well as parents is, Reward process, not outcome, mm. right? Yeah. So motivate the hard work. Don't worry if they get Cs rather than As, right? If they genuinely worked hard at it and tried, 100%. that's the most important thing to encourage. 100%. Go ahead, Robbie. I just want to say, yes. for the record, mm. the big difference between me and Matthew yeah. is that he is goal-oriented yes. and I am process-oriented. Yes. And mm -hmm. the number of times that Matthew judges something based on the outcome. Yeah. Is always. Is always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want I want to get there whether it's finishing a manuscript or um taking a road trip. You know, we'll 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 need to drive to Massachusetts and you know, we can get there in 7 hours on Google and Robbie will want to add all of these. I'm like, why don't we enjoy ourselves? Completely why spurious like side adventures and we get there <laughs> 8 hours late. So for for our for our bus trip I mm. surrendered my desire to control. I never actually have control. That's an illusion. Robbie's always in charge. <laughs> but I said, you're going to decide where we go. I'm going to put my hands on the wheel. You put the stuff in the GPS and I will just drive the bus there. And it was the mm. best year because I didn't have to think about outcomes and destinations. Yeah. We got there mm. eventually and Robbie was in charge. So that's great. anyway, just uh, whether that's I'm an object saying, lesson or not. Matthew likes the A's. I, I do like yeah. movies. Well, but look, I, I think that there's obviously a happy medium. Something a lot of people struggle with is is finishing stuff, yes. right? And if you're just rewarding process, it's very yeah. easy to oh, look get to the 95% line. Well, we've often <laughs> said that it never were, finishes. Yes. If there were two Robbies, yes. we still wouldn't have finished like proofreading our first book. Yeah. And if there were two of me, we would be a smoldering pile of ash <laughs> on the ground. Uh -huh. So it does take both of us. Mm -hmm. Robbie keeps me in check and I keep Robbie ver vertical. Uh, because <laughs> yeah, otherwise, he so, loves her bed very much. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, you got to have some of, some of both, right? Mm -hmm. If you never put something out and have no goals, it's not going to happen. But also, if you don't take time to enjoy and reward the process, why do it? Yeah. I want to also talk about the – because you mentioned it and – I think people will be curious about the salmon fishing. Oh, oh. I'm going to turn it over to Robbie there because this well, is Well, that is my, yes, yeah. it's my gig. So I grew up starting at the age of one and a half. My dad, who is a, uh, uh, what is he? He is an iconoclast. He's, he's he an unusual. He is a, yeah. an entrepreneur. He doesn't follow rules. He is a curmudgeon. He does all the, all the. Crouch, he is a world things. traveler. He's yeah. a self-made man. He's a contrarian. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he's an odd duck. Yeah. And uh, he bought into a 
fishing operation in Alaska, sight unseen, never having really fished before, never having been to Alaska before. His goal was to create an opportunity for the family to all convene and do something interesting and constructive together in the summer months. As a job. So you, you were living roughly where, not roughly, but exactly where you are now, pretty much? So we were living right, like, in the same town. This is, yeah, a, which we is, live now in the town that I grew up in, which is in Maryland, on the east eastern shore of Maryland. It's about as far away from Alaska as you can get, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> still right. be in the United States. Yeah. So yeah, so he bought into this fishing operation, and we had a piece of land up there, and we built a cabin on it and lived it and my dad's never built anything before so of course the cabin was full of holes and leaked all the time our favorite <laughs> pastime was that when it started raining a lot and the roof was leaking we got to chew lots of gum to plug up all the holes in the oh my God. in the ceiling that was the only time we got to chew gum so that was a super bonus for when it rained <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I've been, so it's a commercial salmon fishing operation and we gill net for salmon and we catch, you know, between 50 and 75,000 pounds of salmon a, a summer. We do not live in a boat or fish in a boat. No. So tradi- historically in the fishery up there, the men would go out in the boats and the women would stay on shore and fish from the shore. It's called set netting. With the children, with sort the of children, a women right. and children operation on the right. shore. So but that's our, what we do. But our whole family does it. Robbie's yeah. brother goes up there. I go up there. We're the three main permit holding fishermen. And then we bring a couple people up every year to help us. Yeah. And in the course of an average summer, in our we have three nets that are each the length of a f- football field that we put out uh, on most days. They're huge nets. Yeah. We're off the grid. It's like serious manual labor. It's It's hard work. And I've been doing it. My brother and sister and I started looking after our own nets probably when I was eight and my brother was 10 and my sister was 12. So wow. it's something that we've always done every summer. And it's a job, but it's nice because we unplug. There's no internet. I mean, I guess you can get internet up there now we if you work not really hard yeah. at it. Um, it's super expensive. So yeah, there's no indoor plumbing. That, like there's no... So we love it. We love that our kids get that experience every year. We love yeah. that we you bring that. friends' kids now sometimes. Yeah. 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 Our our good friends from college and their kids came last year. We pretty much every year we bring someone bring who wants to experience yeah. it. It's always hard to try to gauge who is going to be successful up yes. there. A lot of people think, oh, I'd like to go to Alaska. I'm an outdoorsy person. And they picture themselves on a cruise uh, <laughs> on the inner passage. <laughs> and so we are um you know, way out in the middle of nowhere. There's no town, there's no roads, there's no grid. And we love it. And a lot of people do love it, but it's not for everyone. Yeah. There's no, there's no showers, you know, there's no grocery stores. To get there from where you are, is it, is it four flights? Yeah. Four flights. Right? Yeah. But it usually we have to spend, because of the way that the flights work, we usually have to spend the night in an airport somewhere. So our children have become very good at sleeping on benches and floors of airports we usually have like a 14-hour layover either in Seattle or Anchorage. Yeah. It's a jet to Seattle, a jet to Anchorage, a smaller jet to King Salmon, which is this jumping off point on the tundra for a lot of sports fishing adventures or fishermen. And then we charter a bush plane, which is a five or six seater, and take that about 20 minutes across the tundra and land right on the beach by our processing plant. And then somebody comes, picks us up in a pickup truck and drives us two more miles up the beach to our cabin. So it's, it's quite a journey. And when you get there, you're really glad that it's over. And now when our, you know, our kids have been used to doing this every year. And if we ever say we're like, we're going on a flight somewhere and the flight is less than like 12 hours long, they're like, what? That wasn't even, what what are you talking about? <laughs> and honestly, life in Alaska is one of the things that made the tour possible for them because we had yeah. gotten mm-hmm. them used to living without certain seeming necessities yeah. and being uncomfortable <laughs> and being in close quarters. <laughs> and it really helped, I think. I will always remember when you were staying with us a, a couple of years ago, telling your your youngest, hey, nap time, go to sleep. And he walked into a different room and fell asleep. And I was like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> <laughs> a, a thing, and then slept for two, maybe three hours. I don't even remember. I was like, this is a thing. I've been trying to get Audrey uh, at that age. Getting her to take a nap was hell on earth. It just, we, we tried everything. And this was not due to a lack of resolve on my end. We did everything. And I, for the life of me, I could not get this kid to go take a nap unless we were driving in a car. And I tried so hard. And then 
watching you send this whatever three-year-old into another room on his own recognizance to just go to sleep, which he did happily and then slept. I, nothing has made me dislike you more than <laughs> that process because it, it, it made me feel like a total failure in every regard. Uh, and I know every kid is different, but you're, you know, due to where, where you guys live and the salmon fishing and the general, you know, self-reliance that you have instilled in your kids. It was really remarkable to, to witness. Well, Thank you, Brian. they Thank you. came out kind of like that. So your I kids are so awesome. Thank you. They are. And they've always kind of been that way. Yep. They're all great kids. It's always a joy to see them, especially, you know, now that they're getting to be like actual human beings yeah. yes. as they get older. And also a couple of them are pretty into Cuphead, which is a nice. Oh my gosh. They're wow. Really kind of, yeah. They were recounting our visit yes. to you recently where they first played Cuphead yeah. and Alden was talking. Oh, that's about, right. It was here. Yeah, I forgot. It was, it was yes. The, you introduced them to it. Yeah. Wow. I miss playing Cuphead just because my Joy-Con drift is so bad at this point that it's just oh, no. like <laughs> be a losing battle. Wait, do we need to get Leighton some new Joy-Cons? Like this seems like a problem. I mean, this is my third set of Joy-Cons, mm. so I'll live with it. Brian, should we segments? I think we should. All right, so it's that time of the show, everybody. Everybody's favorite time in the show when we get to do our, our world-famous segments. And we hear a lot about these segments. We get lots of calls. We get lots of emails, Facebook DMs, Instagram, instant messages, Snapchats, you know, occasional, occasional MySpace posts uh, about how much people love the segments. Oh, and oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the listener's favorite part of the show. Specifically, people tend to enjoy the uh, maybe less the segment itself than the introduction uh, to the segment, which I, I've come to think of as, as Brian's Corner, where, you know, normally, <laughs> normally on the show. I like to kind of hang back and let Layton drive, so to speak. But, you know, I, I give myself a little gift when I'm introducing the segments where I get to, you know, take a moment to reflect on what came before on the show, uh, what we're doing right now. You know, as you guys know, I have a very live in the moment kind of philosophy and also uh, think about where the show might be going for the next. We're about an hour in. I'd say we have two or three more hours to go. Um <laughs> In the show, and uh, it's just it's just a little gift I give myself every day, uh, or I should say every recording, not actually every day. It's interesting to note that we don't typically record every day, although we are here doing our second recording oh. uh, in as many days. Oh wow! We had a, a fun guest yesterday, um, and today, as, as as people will not know when they hear this because it's coming out a little later, it is Valentine's Day. Oh right, oh, that's right. Yeah. Also Jasper's birthday. Oh, it's Jasper's birthday. Yeah. It is. Robbie was so mad. I really did not want to have a child on Valentine's Day. It was but, such a cliche. Yeah. yeah. But he, he, he was not to be denied. Now, no. Leighton, you palpably scowled when um, Valentine's Day was referenced. Is there something you want to tell uh, us about that? I just, I'm not a holiday person, and it always feels like an inconvenience to me when I realize it's a holiday. So, yes. It's no particular ire towards Valentine's Day. Like, I think. Um, it's a little passe to be cynical about Valentine's Day. I just simply, it's its apathy. I, I, I do agree with that. I do also want to uh, just interrupt you and say that this is kind of my corner, so I'd appreciate it if you kind of <laughs> right, hung of back course. just a little for, for this one portion of the show. Thank uh -huh. you for listening to my woman's voice for about 30 seconds. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. You know, it, it it's, it's literally the most I can do. Um, <laughs> the... I am blessed with a, a spouse who doesn't give two shits about Valentine's Day. And so we don't really do Valentine's Day stuff. We don't go out to dinner. Occasionally, small gifts are accepted or exchanged. This is why I like your wife. Yeah, same. She's sensible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I would rather, you know, she, I'll remind you not to interrupt me when I'm talking. <laughs> uh, the, the, we will occasionally do a quote unquote holiday dinner, not on the holiday because it's easier to get into whatever place we might sure. want to go. Not that we ever go. Please do not interrupt me. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, get into wherever we want to go. We don't go to fancy places. But anyway, this segment is called What's Poppin'. It is our chance. It's our pop culture recommendation segment. Oh, no. It's where we get to... Uh-oh. Please, please. <laughs> I'm begging you, just let me get through this. I'm just trying to get to this segment here. Um, 
This is our, our pop culture recommendation segment. You get to talk about something you've been enjoying recently. It could be a book, a movie, a video game, whatever. We say pop culture. You can do more academic stuff. It doesn't really matter. But we get to expound on the things we've been enjoying recently. The segment, as I said, is called What's Poppin' and the theme song, which we insert in post because the way that Zencaster works, it's impossible to play uh, sound files. They don't let you do it. I don't really understand why, but we can't play sounds. So we insert the theme song for the segment in post and that theme song goes, just calm the fuck down. I see your <laughs> hand. Just wait, wait. The theme song goes here. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? Okay, that was the theme song. Matthew, yes, you have a question. How now now su- Brian's corner is, hold on. Brian's corner <laughs> is over and you can talk at will. How am I supposed to get in the mood if I can't hear the music? I understand your guests can hear it, but I can't hear it and I need to get hyped up. So could you sing it for me or something like that? Yeah, Brian, you should sing it since you're not able to play it. You really should. I think he's not willing to play it. That's my <laughs> personal That I, I resent that <laughs> implication that I'm unwilling to do it. I give so much of myself to this show, Matthew. I, I'm here at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday, on Valentine's Day, no less. My- I haven't heard you start singing the, the, the theme intro music. That Okay, fair enough. It goes yeah, like this. sing it. Bum, 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 bum. What's popping? Bum, 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 bum. I'm Layton. What's popping? <laughs> that's how it goes. I'm ready. I'm that, that's all I needed. There it goes. Thank you for meeting me. So, you're welcome. Layton, what's popping? What's popping for me is a book that I have not yet finished, which is cheap of me, but otherwise, you know, the woman we recorded yesterday, it's always a challenge when we record multiple times in a week. And it's like, I got to come up with multiple peaches and lemons and what's poppins because oh, I'm boring and I don't do things. So it's just piddly shit. Anyway, my poppin is the book, uh, The Confidence Game by Marina Konnikova, which is about oh, the history yeah. of confidence games and uh, scams and con artists. She's great. And it's it's a really fascinating read. I've been eating it up with a spoon. It's great. Highly uh-huh. recommend. She gave a talk at a at a conference I organized once, and she is just a very interesting person. You know, I think she became she's a science writer who then became a professional poker player. I believe mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. That makes yeah. very much sense considering this book. So yeah. Yeah, That's what's popping cool. for me. Like Robbie it. and Matthew, what's popping? I did recently re-listen to and totally appreciate the song Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat by Bob Dylan. If you're not familiar with this song, it's not one of his big hits. There might be no Bob Dylan song that more perfectly captures his attitude, his writing skill. Um, just, just listen to it. It's hilarious. It's a perfect song. There's not many perfect songs. Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat by Bob Dylan. I believe it's on Blonde on Blonde, but it might be on Highway 61. I can't remember. Are you, you know, Brian? Are you a Dylan person? I general? love him. He's my favorite of all time. Yes. He is the person I often trot out as someone I just don't get it. Okay. Uh, lots of people do. I know many people who think of him as you know one of their all-time favorites. So can you – this is not said in an uh, accusatory way. Tell me what you like about Bob Dylan. I feel like art's purpose is to get something that's inside of one person inside of the other person, right? To communicate that as purely as possible. He doesn't care about certain types of aesthetics that some people focus on a lot. He focuses on communication. He focuses on channeling the emotion, channeling the idea, channeling the metaphor, channeling the music that he feels. There is something so authentic about his best work uh, that I, I believe that I am connecting with him in a way that I don't with music that is overly produced or overly tight. Like it's never tight and it's always true. And it's sometimes weird. And I know people have issue with his voice. I think his voice is just right for his music. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. When I hear people cover his songs, I'm always skeptical. There's a few occasions where people have covered his songs. Well, but for the most part, Bob Dylan's songs can only be sung by Bob Dylan, in my yeah. in my opinion. But that song, I think, is not like heralded as, as one of his best known songs. But it is such a good example of him at his best. Okay. And it's funny. I write funny work. I like it when people use humor. He, you know, it's a snide song about his ex girlfriend who he's mad at. So like that's what it boils down to. But 
Hmm. Listen to that song and tell me you've ever heard a better version of that sentiment. So that's okay. that's my old reference. My new one, to show you that I'm cutting edge, <laughs> is the game Celeste, which is a platform wow. gamer that I am nice. not skilled enough to play. So the reason I had children is now I get to watch them play games I can no longer play because the button pushing is so fast now. It's so fast. Mm-hmm. Drift on your Joy-Con or not. Leighton, I can't even beat the first level of Celeste, but Jasper, who is who six, is, six? is doing Seven a magnificent job. Augie, yeah. who is 12, is like getting all the golden strawberries. It's anyway, there's a thing now where game developers use bad graphics from my childhood on purpose because mm-hmm. I think it's the same reason why my daughter wants records, even though she doesn't own a record player. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a yearning for my youth, which I uh, find flattering. Um, so I'm a little upset with the graphics not being better, but they assure me they're just what they're supposed to be. Yeah. I wouldn't, I I wouldn't know anything about that. uh, (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I love watching them play it and how much they enjoy it. So, uh, that's great. So play Celeste while listening to Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat by Bob Dylan. I can't recommend it highly enough. I love it. Also, we would be remiss not to shout out Lena Rain, the composer of the, the score for Celeste, who we had on the show. And oh, she's and a very is talented, a wonderful composer. and talented person. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Okay. I might have to play that for Augie. That's yeah. cool. All right. Yeah. All right, Robbie. Robbie. Um, all right. So mine is, uh, it's a little bit heavy. It's a book called heavy. Mm. It's a memoir by, I had to look up the pronunciation. Kiese Lehman is the guy's name. Okay. It's a memoir. It's about him growing up. As a young black boy in Mississippi, he now teaches, he's a professor somewhere. I don't know. I just picked this book up. And let me tell you, it is wonderful and heartbreaking and true and gorgeously, um, written. gorgeously written and just ultimately like a really moving accounting of what it was like for him growing up as, as a black man in America I mean, he's a contemporary person. Anyway, it's really, really good. And I recommend it to everyone. Awesome. Brian, what's popping? My what's popping this week, it's, uh, this is also a little bit heavy. One of my all-time favorite performers, Mojo Nixon, died last week. And I just want to shout out basically his entire body of work. This guy was... Very, very influential to me. He's a complete maniac. I mean, talk about, you know, the authentic kind of sound that you were talking about with Bob Dylan. That's what Mojo was uh, for me. It was really funny. You know, he's this big hit. Elvis is everywhere in whatever it was, mid 80s. And he was kind of psychobilly, definitely country influenced. Not the world's greatest guitar player, but there's just something about the way the guy plays just fucking rules. He's, I mean, Crass would be an understatement. The guy is borderline pornographic in half of what he wrote. And, you know, as someone who is now in a comedy sex band, was very influenced by by him. So we all have these performers or creatives in our life that that mean a lot to us. And he was a big one for me. Uh, he died at 66, shortly after performing a set on an outlaw country cruise, <laughs> which uh, is 100% the way... He would have wanted to die. One of his heroes that he talked about on stage, and I think a former collaborator, was this guy, Country Dick Montana, who died on stage, you know, was on the list of performers who died on stage. And to know that Mojo, who never met a beer he didn't drink, went out on an outlaw country cruise after screaming about something is is a very fitting end. So I just want to listen to his stuff. It's so, so great and so fun. His Christmas album, I've mentioned on the show, Horny Holidays, is to me the all-time best holiday album ever. <laughs> it's got a fucking brutally great cover of Mr. Grinch on it. Opens with him singing Happy Birthday. Happy He's got this very uh growly voice. Happy birthday to you, you woodworking Jew. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Jesus. And what does he get? You renegade rabbi rabble rouser of Bethlehem. Happy birthday to you. And like, then the album just goes off from there. He was the best. I miss him. And I just want to, you know, shout him out because he's the, he's, he's a very important person to me. Thank wow. You, yeah. Look at all these poppins. Yeah. Now it's time for our final segment, which is one part Greta or, oh, fuck. 
208 episodes in and I'm <laughs> still biffing it multiple times a week. So you're welcome. That's podcasting for you. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to do one peach each and one lemon just because we have more people than usual. So it's time for our final segment, which is typically three parts gratitude exercise and one part petty grousing, but we'll be at a nice one-to-one ratio this time. This is the segment Peaches and Lemons, and here is the theme song for, I don't know, the shiny variant of Peaches and Lemons. Derek, please roll the clip. I'm humiliating myself. One peach, one peach each, one peach, one peach each, one peach, one peach each, one peach, one peach each. Great. That was the theme song for one peach each with an implied lemon. Hmm? No. Um, Robbie, you're going to have to live without it. It's it's very good. You'll hear it when the episode's out. Um, I don't have the ability to play these clips. Someone in this call does have the ability to play I these know, clips. Talking talking about. Okay, I, Brian sang it last time. I can, I I can promise up. no enthusiasm. Yeah. I can promise <laughs> no um, alacrity. I can't promise any enthusiasm in return. Okay. That's not a guarantee <laughs> with this podcast. Uh, so we'll each start with one lemon, which is a thing that is a minor bummer, annoyance, just a dumb stupid little thing. I'll go first. My lemon is my tummy hurts. That's it. Aww. Like like right okay. now? Oh, yeah. Through this whole thing. Yeah. Aww. I'm so sorry. You're covering it very well. No, it's okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I live with the pain. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else. I have a name. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lemon. Yeah. Uh, so we live as if we just graduated from college like mere minutes ago. Yeah. Um, our <laughs> cutlery drawer... Yeah is full of an assortment of cutlery that we just have collected because we've refused to buy our own because it's too many, too many decisions. So most of the spoons have been in the, uh, in the garbage disposal, garbage disposal. So they're not oh, yes, smooth. Of course. So like so great when you spoons, eat them, eat off of them. It's like you get, you get wounds and the <laughs> forks, Children or Matthew or everybody other than me has used them to pry things open so the tines aren't aligned. Oh, so brutal. there's one that sticks out. So when you take it out of your mouth, mm-hmm. anyway. Robbie is tough in all ways. She flies 4,000 miles and thrashes around in the Bering Sea wearing rubber pants, pulling live fish out of the ocean with her hands. And then she cuts them open with a knife and she can't eat on a fork that has a Tine that's a half millimeter it's misaligned. The worst. It's, I hate it. It's really embarrassing. I don't know. The inside of your mouth is like one of the cavities on your body that you really Thank don't you. want to fuck around with. Protuberance you. wise. You get together and have your special forks that work. Someday you know. we'll buy some forks, but right. it hasn't happened yet. This is yeah. thirty this is, years. This later. is not enough of a lemon to motivate you to take action. No, because no. the other lemon is probably trying to find the perfect right. cutlery set that I'm yeah. willing to spend money on, and I'm just not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did your guys' parents have like nice silverware that got trotted no, out my at parents never holidays? Did. Yeah, I think my grandmother had a box of silver silverware that. Would yes, come my out. parents did too, yeah. and yeah. you had to clean them with like silver polish. Yes, it was in a wooden box. Yes. It was like felt on the inside, yes. and all yeah. of the the this type of fork would stack here, and that fork, yep, and there were that's way right. too many forks. Were and when we have had like a fancy occasion at the house, and there were probably eight or so place settings for this, we would bring that out. And then it's like, oh, and now we can't fucking like wash them the normal way and silver poly. Yeah, it was a what, what happened to this set? I don't know. My sister probably has it. But <laughs> yes, we had one like set of silver silverware. And now in, in my current age, I cannot imagine owning such a thing or ever no. using it. No. Like why? Apparently yeah. there's a real crisis because uh, uh, adults are trying to give their sets of china and silverware to their children because it's important to them. Adults, and they like, oh. older adults than us. And, Our generation yes. is like, we don't want it. And, and we don't they're want like, it. what? This is, this is our generations the, of our the family. The world is a wash in yeah. China yeah. that new people like myself <laughs> no longer want. Yeah, we got uh, from one of Rachel's relatives like an entire giant box full of crystal ware. No, yeah. yeah, which is lovely, but what? Yeah, like I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to use that. Um, and also, I don't have the wherewithal to sell it. Is this your lemon? Or <laughs> it is not. <laughs> okay. no. right. I have not yet begun to lem. Okay, um, my lemon is it could go peach, it could go lemon, depending on which end of it you're looking at, all right? I love my dog, Goji, 
He's a cute little pug that we got accidentally while we were having ice cream in Utah on we our bus get tour. Accidentally, it was ac- got, it was a tragedy. We got-, <laughs> we got him and I love him, but he's one year old and he still doesn't understand that he's supposed to poop outside. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. by now he's supposed to know. And you take him outside, you walk him around for a long, long time. He looks at you. He convinces you that he's fine. You bring him inside and he poops the second he gets inside. Yep. It is just galling this dog that won't poop. Yeah. Inside, outside, yeah. inside. Mm-hmm. Yes. Anyway, yeah. that is my lemon for today. It's relatable. The, the dog that you've seen intermittently is six years old, and sometimes she... Oh, don't tell us it's going to keep going. No, I yeah. need to be convinced that she <laughs> hasn't figured out by now. She just... She'll she'll do the same thing. She she hates walking. I don't want to walk either, and neither does she. She has no brain cells in all farts. So yeah. Oh, that's, that's also hard. Are you yeah. sure that you, we don't have the same? Yeah, we dog. might be sharing it's, a dog. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Brian, what's your lemon? My lemon is this is not the lemon, but I have finished signing all of the uh, upcoming Ninja Sex Party albums, and they had to be picked up in two sets: one big set, and one slightly smaller set. First set, guy shows up at my house, takes all the boxes, goes to put them on a pallet. This is set up by our, our our managers, so great. Give the boxes to the guy. It's all good. For this next set, which I just sent out uh, a couple days ago, guy shows up at the house, and he's like, where are the labels? I'm like, well, the first set didn't need labels. And the guy's like, yeah, this one does. Bye. <laughs> I, I was like... Excuse me? Did the rules change? You know, once a year, my house is overtaken with boxes. You know, we put them in our front room. They stack floor to ceiling, and it's a necessary part of the job. And I was so ready to be done, have these boxes out the door. And this guy, by the way, is a different guy. You know, he's not making the rules. He certainly didn't do anything wrong. It was just galling to be on the verge of getting this stuff out of my house, only to be just hammered down. Where are the labels? So now at this point, the labels have been printed. The boxes have been taken. But I was very close to finally getting these out of the house. And then it didn't happen. That's my lemon. Rest in pieces. Yes. Now it is time for us each to do one lemon, which can be a thing, big or small, that is nice, cool, good, fun, exciting. Fuck. Uh, (laughs) We'll each do one peach. That's I've lost all confidence in this. Uh That's okay. You're You're doing great, Leighton. Don't patronize me. My peach <laughs> is... But do sign up for patreon.com slash late night. Yeah, for weekly show, minisodes, yeah. access to all video episodes, other stuff. Yep. Anyway, my peach is ice cream <laughs> sandwiches. Just a classic ice cream sandwich. I think mm-hmm. after we finish here, I'm going to go eat one as a breakfast ice cream sandwich. I like that. Yeah. That's but great. You can't go wrong with them. I mean, that, that weird little chocolate cookie... And it, I don't know what they put in this. Top of your mouth. It's weird. Yes, it's got a weird it's texture. It's good. And when they're like melty, that's when they're at their peak, right? If it's too hard, like, that's a bad scene. Yes. Lick the full circumference. It's yes. great. That's my peach. If you take it out of its little package and it kind of droops just a little, that's that's the best yep. time to eat it. Because yep. then clearly the ice cream is like melted enough that you can just bite it too. Yeah. Yeah. That's my peach. What about y'all? My peach is a box of 500 X-Acto blades that I bought approximately 15 years ago um, that I've used only a tiny portion of, maybe like 3%. And uh, I'm just glad to know it exists for the rest of my life, that I will be able to just (laughs) go and get a new X-Acto blade whenever I want. Do you know where it is so that the second you need it, you can get it? It's in that drawer right over there. It's right over there. Mm -hmm. Can you you show the people? Is it it this right here? It's one of those blades. It's one yes. of those. And you have, yep. Yep. You have hundreds five, of these. 500. Well, now there's like 483 or I something. had no idea mm-hmm. that you were so dangerous. When your children inherit this, they're going to be excited yes! about it. That's, right? Exactly. That's true. They've it's already practical. coveted it several times. And it's compact and it's hard to break. Yeah. Go ahead. What's yours? Um, mine is writing early, early in the morning. Mm. When I'm so tired that my brain isn't quite on yet. And I'm able to really just sort of get into a, a zone of of writing. And it, and I, I'm so tired, I also am not remembering. So later when I read what I've written, I'm surprised by it because I don't remember having written it in the first place. It's invariably smarter than I am. 
I could also have recommended earlier George Saunders' book, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, which is this incredible mm-hmm. book about the craft of writing and also just how to be a human. And one of the things he says is that his writing is smarter than he is. And I love the times when I have insights or I'm able to express something that I would never be able to in my conscious day-to-day life. I think that writing and creative expression, you're, I mean, you, everybody here is a creator. I love that. And I hope that you all saw, have some version of this where the act of creation is an act of discovery of something about myself or the world that I never would have gleaned or been able to put my finger on if I hadn't made that thing. And that's the very selfish part of creativity for me. That's just for me. Like maybe somebody else benefits from it, but that's the joy that I get when I'm making something and I see something for the first time that kind of takes me by surprise. I definitely feel that like when I've written a particularly gross song about testicles, I'm like, (laughs) wow, I really, really found something new today. Yeah. I'm so glad you understand me, Brian. (laughs) Yeah. The 4 a.m. coffee and writing session is just like the greatest thing in the world. I live for that. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you, Leighton. I was just going to concur that Matthew's writing is smarter than he is. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's true. I just said that, so I can't be offended by it. I just wanted to underline that. (laughs) I can't remember where I heard this recently. It might have been on the Good One podcast. Uh, They were referring to something... Uh, Dan Harmon said once where he, I guess, you know, famously he uh, was a difficult person to work for and would push these writers very, very hard. And then if I'm remembering this correctly said, he realized that was a, a, not only being kind of a bad person, but also totally unnecessary because he spent just as much time revising drafts. He had spent, you know, a great deal of work on as he did drafts that he just kind of shat out. Huh. And when he had that realization that he was revising them the exact amount, mm. no matter what it was, he gave up being precious about, yeah. you know, first drafts and just like, get that shit out there because we're going to work on it again, no matter what. And I thought that was a very useful thing regarding, you know, just getting the stuff out and your writing being smarter than you because it's going to get there eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hell yeah. Brian. Yeah, uh, my peach is my sister's coming to town this weekend for for a week, uh, her and her daughter. And it's always exciting. You know, we live on different coasts of the country. And one thing you realize as you get older is that when you actually get to see friends in person, it is a rare gift, uh, especially if you don't live in the same place. And even more so when it's, you know, a person you've known your entire life, like a like a sibling. So uh, I'm just excited to see her and come to L.A., she is going to be out with her teenage daughter who has said that there's precisely one thing she's excited about doing in LA and that is going to the Grove. Oh. Which is a mall. Oh. What the fuck? <laughs> is she but okay? But that's fine. She's down. Her, daughter, her daughter's great. Why does she want to go to the Grove? <laughs> she's seen it on TV or in shows or something or heard about it. So. You've never taken me to the Grove, probably. Not, yeah. no. You're going to take her to like the Americana brand, right? Just to level the... Well, I could do both. So, so Matthew and Robbie, just so in case you don't know, and how could you not know this? The Grove is a is a fancy outdoor mall in L.A. It's near like Miracle Mile, where a bunch of the museums, tar pits are, stuff like that, and it's very bougie and upscale. And it sucks. And it sucks. <laughs> but maybe not if you're 15. Who, who am I to judge? But there's the designer of that mall. The mall was so successful, opened and essentially exact copy, you know, whatever, half an hour east in Glendale called the Americana, which is notable for being just a complete shit show of a mall (laughs) and is one of my least favorite places in the world. Uh, And it's one of those malls where there's like apartments over it that you can live in if you love this mall so much that you can live above the mall, which sounds like my personal idea of hell. Layton, yeah. you should try it. It's like a big 
center fountain. There's like a little train. They're playing Frank Sinatra really loud. It's a glut of people, you know, Sephora, Barnes & Noble, movie theater, uh, f- Cheesecake Factory, horrible, Cupcake horrible ATM. place. Cupcake ATM. And we all act like the Americana is better than the Grove and the Galleria across the street, which is an indoor mall. And that indoor mall does suck. But, uh, you know, you got to pick a side and I'm on the side of the Americana. So I love the Americana, actually. And I would live in one of those apartments and (laughs) probably go insane. We should do that. We should rent Airbnb, an apartment above the Americana and live there for a day or whatever and just see what it's like. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> and it would probably cost us like $20,000 or some shit. Oh, it's got, it can't be cheap. Yeah. But think, 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 Layton, about being able to wake up, you know, early in the morning and go wander around a closed mall. Ooh, it would be <laughs> I mean, that does appeal to the dead mall bone in my body. So anyway, so will I be taking my niece and sister to a mall in Los Angeles? You bet I will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, guys, thank you for being here. Thank you. Always a pleasure to to talk and catch up and everything. And, you know, this, as we said, we were originally, the idea was to get you guys on before you left for your big bus trip. And because that was an insane undertaking and uh, you just didn't have time, I'm glad we were able to do it after the bus trip in here. All I'm glad it. we survived the bus trip. So, yeah. Um, yes. So. Thanks yeah. for having us. <laughs> and emerge with one more living creature in your one home more dog. than yeah. you originally mm-hmm. had. Who will not poop, in, won't poop yeah. inside. Yeah. I mean, outside. outside. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, no, you're setting an intention. Will not poop inside. I know. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank That's, you. Uh, damn. We just have to keep damn. believing it. All right. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, if people want to find your books or find you on social media or anywhere else, what would you like to plug? Um, they should find us on Instagram at Robbie with no E R O B B I dot and dot, dot Matthew, Matthew dot com. Or you can just Google Robbie Bear and you will find all the things about us because she's Bear. the only one. B E H R B E H R R O B B I B E H R. If you if you type um Robbie and Matthew with with an E, Robbie Rob I E, you get a Canadian wedding There's band. A Canadian wedding band, Robbie. Oh, Robbie what? Band. Ooh. Yeah. They're they're like they're very, very smooth looking guys. They, they look very mm. charming. But and they don't want to tell you anything about our books. They I'm know sure. they know nothing about yeah. us. In fact, they probably <laughs> resent us deeply for yes. the for the similarity. Let's book them for the next episode. <laughs> Do it. The other Robbie and Matthew. I actually would love to connect with yeah. them at some point and find out more about what them. the story is we do a two-way call we get robbie and matthew and robbie and matthew yeah. and you duke it out for the seo yes. could yes. you make that happen sometime that would be amazing <laughs> i think be that'd amazing. be great um you yeah. can find our books anywhere on your your favorite indie bookstore of course is the best place to get them but um, so it's the cookie chronicles series yes which is all books start with ben yokoyama and the cookie of doom cookie, cookie of, of perfection endless waiting the cookie thief cookies of chaos and so on. The Real McCoys, which yes. is a middle grade mystery series. And um, they have so many pictures, guys. I yeah. do so many pictures. Robbie it just hard. makes hard to know nuts. how many pictures there are. Yeah. So the, the, for, for context, the way these books look is it's not just text and then illustration. The illustrations are woven in to the text and are an integral part of the experience of reading the book. Like the words are part of what you you do when you when you draw. It's it's incredible. It, it seems like an ungodly amount of work. It, it is, is an ungodly amount of work. work. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate but it. Definitely harder than writing, it seems. Oh, I hear that all the time. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is a thing that, that happens a lot around here, that statement. Um, and then we have some picture books for the younger kids. But yeah, you can find us any, anywhere books are sold, yes. I think is the, the phrase that we use. But yeah. Right. And yes. you upload a minute Yes, video, we, we, video do, every we day. do a project called The Daily Minute that a friend of ours told us that we had to do and we never stopped doing. So every day for one minute on all of our social media and YouTube, um, we post a one minute of, uh, of our day and uh, whatever we're doing. And it's yeah. often completely unremarkable and dull. Um, but we uh, shoot the shit for a few minutes and have a good no, time. No, for exactly one minute. Oh, yes. Although the standards were a little loose on the bus trip. Yeah, if you want to know anything about the bus trip, busloadofbooks.com. The whole, you can relive the you entire relive year. You can relive the entire trip. One minute at a time. Yeah. So, yeah. And you should at least, even if you don't relive the trip, go look at the bus because yeah. the bus itself is a phenomenal work of art. It looks cool on the outside. What you guys did on the inside is even more impressive. It's 
It's nuts. It's like Thanks. whatever people are picturing, it is better. <laughs> All right. Well, that's our show. Everybody, thank you for listening. You can join us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash late night for benefits. If you give us money, you're welcome. Please do that. <laughs> I don't have anything pithy to say. Does anybody have anything pithy oh, to Ma- say? Oh, Matthew, uh, we actually have the 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 king of pithy here. May, maybe impactful. Let, let's substitute the word impactful for pithy. So, Matthew, close us out here. Does it have to be funny too, or can it just be? Impactful? No, he doesn't. Have- oh, it never is. It's never funny. Don't oh, it's worry. Never about funny. That. No, no, no. All right. Um, here's the thing that we learned spending a year traveling this country in our school bus pulling up to gas stations and parking lots and people who were in uh, vehicles that looked nothing like ours, uh, people who would clearly never have come up to talk to us if we'd been driving a regular car or an RV, would come up and start conversations. And we had the experience and pleasure of talking to people from across the political spectrum, from every background, different ages, people who are not our natural community or tribe, whatever that is. And we had lovely interactions with Americans in every color of state across the country. And it restored our faith in humanity to have this thing that brought us together. We didn't meet a single person all year who thought it was a bad idea to give books to kids, who didn't think that driving the bus around, talking about creativity was a bad thing. And so by Spending, who didn't want to support teachers and who didn't want to support kids. Right? Yeah. Almost everybody knows a teacher. and was like, yeah. oh yeah, they could use some support. Like we all have certain very powerful things in common, and yet we overlook those and focus on the things that we disagree about. And there's another way to go about it. We can focus on the things we do agree about instead, find the common ground, find the common humanity. And then if we need to talk about the things we disagree about, it's on this foundation of shared respect. So like, I think that is a really powerful lesson that we learned that I don't know how to communicate to others. I think everybody should have to live in a bus for a year, perhaps, but that wasn't pithy. But I think that's the most no. important thing we learned is that there's good people doing good stuff everywhere. That's great. All I right. love it. All right. Beautiful. All right. All right. See you next time, Perfect. everybody. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Leighton Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Knight, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Knight, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com.